Hey everybody, it's uh, Larry Kotlikoff. I'm here with my close friend and uh, colleague, Edward Lemer, professor of economics at, at UCLA. So let me just say before you go on, how good it is to be in the same room with you after all the COVID experience and all. So it's great to be here, Larry. Uh, great to have you, Ed. And so Ed came to uh, Providence to uh, visit and we've been catching up. It's been like three years since we saw each other. Yeah. Uh, Ed's one of my very favorite economists in the world. Um, he, let me uh, kind of go through his bio and then we're going to talk about, we're going to start off talking about the recession. He's been doing some uh, work for many years now on forecasting uh, before, well, and during that recent years, but, but before that he was working uh, primarily in econometrics, which is kind of economics, uh, statistical analysis of economic data, and then also working on another area, which is kind of not closely connected to econometrics necessarily, uh, but international economics. And, uh, but Ed is gonna tell us how all these uh, three areas of interest have intertwined in his, in his career. But let me just mention that he's, um, he was a, I met him at Harvard when I was in grad school. He was a assistant professor and then became an associate professor at Harvard. Uh, then he joined the uh, uh, economics department at UCLA as a professor of economics. And I, uh, when I graduated two years later, he went in 75. I followed him in 77 to UCLA. So it's my first job. I guess I couldn't stay away. Um, uh, he was the chairman of the department there for from 83 to 87. Uh, then in 1990, he moved to the Anderson School, Graduate School of Management at UCLA, and uh, was appointed as the Chauncey Medbury Chair uh, of Business of Economics. Or, we would call it economics. Of economics, okay. Uh, so Ed's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a fellow of the Econometric Society, He's a research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research. Um, and he's worked with the IMF, the Federal Reserve, uh, the Council of Economic Advisors in, in uh, two, two different governors in uh, California, Wilson and Schwarzenegger and Mary Garcetti in, in Los Angeles. So he's been advising state government in, in uh, California where he's uh, based uh, still, and he's advised the Bureau of Economic Analysis, one of our government agencies that work with the National Academy of Sciences. So uh, Ed was also my vice presidential candidate when we decided to run for, uh, for president in 2016 in our chaotic, uh, quite quixotic moment of trying to uh, fix the country. Uh, Ed went to Princeton, got a BA in mathematics. Uh, he has a PhD in economics from the University of Michigan, also a BA in mathematics, sorry, an MA in mathematics from the University of Michigan. Uh, he's published over 120 articles and five books. And these articles are published, if you look at Ed's uh, Vita, uh, you know, if you're familiar with like science and nature, these are the top journals in in um, in the science field, everybody is familiar. Somebody's published something in science and nature means it's a fantastic study. Ed's CV, if you print it out, it's like one top journal article after another uh, in all these articles in Econometrica, which is one of the very top, if not the top journal in economics. So um, uh, he's been doing all kinds of interesting stuff uh, and we're gonna to start today with talking about what's on a lot of people's mind, which is the recession uh, that people are forecasting, but doesn't quite show up. Uh, if we go back about a year now, you'll have Jamie Dimon saying, sitting down for an interview with CNN or whatever and saying, he's the head of uh, JP Morgan Chase, which is the biggest bank in the world, saying that a recession was coming, a, an economic hurricane, he called it, was coming, but he wasn't sure when. I well, that's that, true. So eventually it will be here. Yeah, I thought that was a brilliant, for, brilliant forecast. And then he had Larry Summers, not to be 
Beaton in the, at this game also was on the tube speaking about the coming economic recession, massive recession we're going to have. Uh, exactly one wasn't so clear. Then you had the, in the fall, you had the head of Goldman Sachs saying the same thing. And uh, for some reason, the economy didn't actually believe these guys. It didn't trust, it didn't, didn't actually follow their orders and produce a recession. So tell us why not, whether we were safe for a while or whether it's just uh, that uh, Diamond's hurricane is coming three months from now or six months from now. And right. I'll give you a suggestion for why it might <laughs> well, happen. Well, yeah. if you know how to use the information, economists are perfectly accurate in the following sense. Never before have they ever called a recession. Recession occurred and they said that was recession. So they got, if you knew that they were wrong, you would have thought the recession coming. Now they're all saying the recession is coming. And if you know they're wrong, if you understand the quality of their thinking, it means it's not going to occur. That's a, 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 a silly kind of thing. But let me talk about uh, the evidence about whether recession is coming. The bond market has a very good indicator of an imminent recession which is an inverted yield curve with a 10 year treasury offering more than two year or, or more than three month treasuries. Uh, and that inverted yield curve is both a predictor and a cause of recessions. So what's the prediction story? The prediction story is why would anybody buy a 10 year treasury that paid less than a three month? Normally you expect if you're locking up your money for 10 years, you wanna get a higher yield. Right. Why would you ever do that? Well, you've got to have confidence that that three-month rate is going to fall, and you could get a good rate for a little while, but it's not going to last long. Why is it going to fall? Because the Fed is going to say, oh, my God, recession's coming, mm -hmm. and we've got to lower that interest rate in order to make it soft or in order to prevent it from coming. And uh, so that's, uh, that's the prediction. I think there's also a causal, causal story which is that uh, banking sector that controls the lending in the economy and therefore the economic growth. And the banking sectors make intermediation profits. They take uh, deposits at short-term rates and um, it may be instantaneous. You can go back and get the money immediately. And then they make long-term, longer-term loans. So right. they work intermediate between the short-term and long-term loans. And if the long-term rates are higher than the short-term rates, they make profits off that. And then in addition, they make profits for by identifying who's a trustworthy borrower and who is a risky borrower. <clears throat> but when the yield curve is steep, they're willing to dip into the barrel of risky borrowers because they have it, the risk is softened by the cash flow that comes from intermediation profits. But when that yield curve inverts, the bank inverts starts, means it's higher early and lower in the future. Yeah, exactly. So the yield curve mean the, the short-term interest rates are high, the long-term interest rates are low. Yes. That's what we have now. So flat means that there's near zero profits from their intermediation activity. Right. If you get profits, it has to be upward sloping. If it's inverted, you're making losses by taking deposits at higher right. rate and make longer. So when that occurs, the banks have to be very careful about who they lend to. And um, particularly in the housing sector, Typically, we've had low interest rates that have encouraged banks to give loans to the least credit worthy borrowers. And when the Fed jacks up that short term rates and creates a flat or an inverted yield curve, the banking sector says, sorry, we can't give you these loans anymore because you're too risky. So it's a loan is a risk elevation. And when that occurs, it kills off the housing market. It kills off the <clears throat> automobile market. And typically, those are the two drivers that carry us into recessions, which is construction jobs. Let me back up. Uh, what's a recession, you might ask. What's and, a recession? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. So the economists that have a committee that decides when the recession began and when it ended, but they do not have a definition, nor they do, do, do they have an algorithm. So my suggestion is we should regard the recession as an illness of the economy, because there's unwanted idleness. The, the markets are failing us because they allow for unwanted idleness in, in the labor market, which is unemployment, 
but idleness of all kinds of capital. So you have uh, empty office buildings, empty apartments, you have uh, cap capacity utilization manufacturing way down. So something's gone wrong with the market system, which is supposed to prevent, uh, the market's supposed to clear so that the, all these items will be efficiently used. Uh, and, and then the recession then is created by a, a violation of the conditions that give rise to uh, a lim limited amount of vitalness. And typically it's houses, and which is construction. Houses go down tremendously. They're very much dependent on bank lending. And secondly, consumer durables. Mm -hmm. You can think of the interest rate as the price of durability, that interest rate goes up and that durable item becomes more expensive. So you get job losses, unwanted job losses in the housing market and in construction and unwanted idleness in uh, consumer durables. So right now we've got, well, we have a very low unemployment rate. It's like, what is it, 3.6 right now? Yeah, it's up and down a little bit, but about it's, that number. It's very low. So overall across the economy, we're not seeing this kind of problem. Are you seeing it in, in housing? Are you seeing it in consumer durables? I mean, when you said the price of durables is higher, uh, that means that you know if I put money into a car and foregoing interest, that's the sense in which the interest rate is the price of holding yeah. onto a durable or even sitting in a house. It's what we call the opportunity cost or the holding cost. But are you seeing right now in the economy, I mean, we do have an inverted uh, yield curve. Yeah. The nominal yields, short-term nominal yields are probably around four or 5% for a few out. To, but then long-term, they're more like two and a half, three. Yeah, about that. 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 So on the other hand, uh, the inflation projection is such that the real yields are also somewhat higher in, in the short run, but it's not very steep, that yield cur curve. So it's not, you know, if we're, we're talking about a, a yield curve that's in real, in real inflation adjusted terms, interest rates, as opposed to nominal interest rates that don't adjust for inflation, it doesn't look all that inverted. Of course, relative to what it might've been you know, two years ago, it could look, it could look quite inverted. Well, um, yeah. you say real, but you can talk about a real rate of return on three-month treasury, but a 10-year treasury requires you to forecast what inflation is going to be going forward. Right. And if inflation is, it persists at this level for the next 10 years, the people who hold those 10-year bonds are going to be suffering terribly. And I, I really think that... <clears throat> We need higher yields across the spectrum in order to create real yields. But you, you raise an important point, and I want to emphasize it, which is we look backward in order to see the future. So historically, an inverted yield curve like we have now has predicted a recession with great accuracy. I have models that, that uh, statistical models that say the chance of a recession within the one year from April of this April to 2023 and, and March of 2024, that probability is about 95% based on that model. So I'm telling you the bond market is scared to, to death about the coming recession. But you said, what about Main Street? Wall Street, bond market is scared. What about Main Street? Well, at Main Street, the story in recession, the first thing that collapses is homes, sales of homes. And then comes uh, consumer durables, automobiles in particular. The thing about this time is the, the Fed's low interest rates didn't create excessive building of homes. The normal rate of building is about 1.5 million new starts per year, 1.5 million. And when the Fed back in 2003 and four kept the interest rates so low, that jumped up the building to 2.1 2.2 million per year, huge. Okay, okay so we we created this terrible overbuilding. This time, the the building peak, the starts peaked at about 1.7, if I remember, 1.7 million per year, and and they went down a little bit, but now they've had a big uh, jump back in the last month. So the housing market looks like it's not going to behave the way it has historically. We're not going to get the loss of construction jobs like we had in uh, 2008 down there. So, so mortgage rates have gone, you know, long-term mortgage rates are going up, you know, six, 7%. Uh, do people, you think that people 
I mean, the market is predicting that rates will come down through time. So do you think people are, are not so concerned about 30-year rates because, or even 15-year rates because they think they can refinance? Is that what what's in the back of their mind? Why would you be building all these homes when mortgage rates are high and people are saying they're too high for me to buy a house? Well, see, normally at this point in the yeah. incipient recession, yeah. the builders are saying, damn, we really overbuilt. Nobody's going to buy one of our new homes for a long, long time until some of these old homes fall apart. And so they think it's not just a price thing, it's the overbuilding problem. Mm -hmm. And this year, this time we didn't get any overbuilding. So the builders apparently think they'll be able to get a fair rate of return on the building that they are starting now, uh, even though the interest rates are high. You probably don't remember, but I remember having loans at eight or nine percent. And, and those sales occurred because you th thought of the, that as a permanent condition. So our new, okay, so building is up and our new home purchase is up too? Is that? I mean, yeah, they people, bounced back too. So people are buying even at these high interest rates. Yeah, that's one because, point, okay. So maybe that's because they realize that with inflation, the high interest, the high, the, no, the nominal interest rate is high, but the real interest rate is still quite low. If you're running a 5% inflation, or four and a half, and you're paying six and a half, then you're paying two percent real, and maybe they're saying people are realizing that the rates are actually not that high. More and and yeah, uh, there's a scarcity of homes. Okay. So if I think I'm going to buy one now, I can get I'm going to be able to cash in on that scarcity and be able to pay get a, a higher price later on when I sell it to somebody else. So mm -hmm. scarcity is ultimately a driver in the housing market and a willingness of people to buy. There's also demographics, right? We've got a lot of, I mean, uh, the country is projected by the UN to grow by the population of the Philippines by the end of the century. Uh, now, a lot of that are, growth has to do with uh, low wage immigrants coming into the country, people who may not be able to afford to buy homes. Uh, but we do have, unless things are fundamentally going to change compared to a few years ago, we have this increase by almost a third in the projected population just over the next 80 years of the population. I mean, it's, imagine you had 120 million Filipinos come today to the U.S. Where would they locate? And they'd locate in the, or mostly in the cities, right? And they so, need, need new homes. And they would need new homes, right. So <laughs> maybe there's something connected to the demographics too. But anyway, you're not seeing, you are in your, and you are not predicting a recession. Well, what what have, are you predicting? There's one more point that I think is an important one, which is uh, we were in, during the industrial age, uh, the, one of the biggest sources of job loss was in manufacturing. And manufacturing always had these V where you lose a couple million jobs for uh, 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 nine months, 10 months, and you get them all back within another nine or 10 minutes. And v, 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 every recession had that kind of V associated with it. And um, those Vs turned into kind of lazy Ls. In the last two recessions, you, lost, you had the first stroke of the V and you lost a bunch of jobs. And then you had a second stroke, which was even more lost. And those jobs never came back. So we started with uh, about 35% of our workforce in manufacturing in the 60s. This was like 60s. 50, 50, 60s? 60s, yeah. 35%, okay. And now it's down to 8 or 9%. So you could lose 10% uh, of manufacturing jobs, and that wouldn't be a large fraction of the total jobs because manufacturing is so unimportant at this point. So you're saying that in the past, manufacturing was kind of, the driver of recessions, uh, you could count on people becoming unemployed, kicked out of you know their jobs, and then brought back for a load. So companies would temporarily shut down, in effect. And you're saying that manufacturing is too small a segment of the economy right now for that to really be a major factor, like a, as big a factor. So is your bottom line that Ed Lemer is predicting a recession or not? It's 50-50. The bond market says for sure th but that's uh, Main. That's Wall Street. Main Street says I don't really think so. 
Right. Okay. <laughs> so my concern would be with, uh, and I mentioned this on the podcast before, with bank failures, we've had since uh, the founding of the country, since the Constitution was formed, we've had every 15 years on average a recession. And if you just Google recessions and you look at the titles of the recession, it says the panic of uh, or the crisis of. Yeah. And these are about financial panics and financial crises. So if you go back to 2008, we had a financial crisis, no question about it. We had 400 and some banks failed. We had many more banks failed actually, actually during the SNL crisis, but that lasted more like a decade. Uh, but anyway, and we had 17 major banks fail. Just in the last couple of months, we've had the second, third, and fourth largest bank failures in the country's history. Yeah. So, uh, and then we know from the F, from studies that economists have been doing that about more than half of the 4,200 FDIC insured banks are actually underwater right now. If you mark their assets to market, they're bankrupt. So, uh, you know, if uh, things are pretty fragile, you could have their uninsured deposits continue to be drained out and head to mutual fund money markets, in which case these banks will go under. And you could have thousands of banks go under and that could precipitate a financial crisis and would that lead to higher would that be connected to higher interest rates yes because people will not trust a bank to to lend to unless they're getting higher interest because there's a bigger risk and will that lead to people to banks resisting loans making loans and uh, for construction and other things yes will that put people out of jobs yes so that all kind of goes together so my concern is with the bank, the financial system. I think we're, we haven't taken any real steps going back now to SVB's Silicon Valley Bank's failure. We've seen Signature Bank, Silicon Valley Bank, and was, what was the Northern, Northern Trust? Yeah. Uh, and then we've seen Citigroup, and no, we've seen uh, Credit Suisse, a massive international bank. Uh, if Credit Suisse can fail, JP Morgan can fail. Citigroup can fail. Uh, Wells Fargo can fail. Uh, these. Uh, I don't think that's all. That's true. So, but but in yeah, addition, but tell me why not. Uh, the failure means that that enterprise is hired by or t- taken over by another bank. It doesn't mean the banking operation is eliminated. So there's still deposit taking and there's still lending going on. The question is whether the this these crises that you're talking about have some fundamental impact on Main Street in terms of access of small businesses and uh, and individual homeowners to getting support for what well, they want to accomplish. So in 2008, see, my sense is that you're right, that we had massive bank, fail- big bank failures and small bank failures. Uh, and that we had another big bank called the Federal Reserve that stepped in to make loans. It wasn't like we lost our banking system. It wasn't like you couldn't get a loan. You had to go over there rather than over here. Maybe you, uh, maybe those folks over there didn't know you as well as your local banker uh, that you've been borrowing from for a while. But, but I don't think uh, companies waited for uh, to see things kind of get resolved before they started laying off. I'm a company let's say I'm working kind of uh, on a tight tight conditions. I'm having, you know, meeting payroll, but not by a wide margin. And I hear that you're firing your workers and or might be firing, or I get that sense that there's a recession possibly coming. We got enough, Jimmy, Di- Jimmy Diamond's talking about it. We have enough public display of banks failing. And I get scared and I fire my workers who are your customers. You're firing your workers or my customers, the whole thing melts down before the Fed can calm everybody down. But it could be more psychological. So my sense is that these things are more psychological, mobile equilibria events that the economy can go flip from one equilibrium 
one position to another and more or less instantaneously. That's how I view what happened in 2008. Disagree. I, I don't think that it was a financial problem uh, fundamentally. It was incredibly overbuilt housing created by the Federal Reserve with low interest rates that simulated the building at rates above 2 million units per year. And that yeah. overbuilding meant that you had to have a timeout in the economy before we needed more homes. So that killed off the construction sector, which is very big in California, by the way. And then the internal counties of California were doing a lot of construction. That was gone. Uh, but I think more, most importantly, the, yeah. the 2008 and 2009 downturn is when we lost the most number of manufacturing jobs. And they just never came back. So you never That's where I went from like twelve percent of GDP to end eight percent. Yeah. Okay. And 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 the problem is, you don't get a V-shaped recovery. You lose a bunch of bunch bunch of stuff, and you start out at a lower level because those manufacturing jobs just don't come back. So, so my, you know, my anyway. Bottom line, I think it's the, it's still a Main Street problem more than a Wall Street or a banking problem. See, my my bottom line would be it's psychological because so many of the Things that were said at the time about the cause of, about that we're going to have a great recession, even the name that was given, the recession never turned out to be so great. It was 81, 82. The, un the unemployment rate also went up to 10%. So there's nothing super great about the great recession, except somebody decided to call it that. Maybe Obama was running for president, decided to call it, you know. Uh, well, that was one game. of the more most long, that's probably the most long lasting uh, recession that we had because of the failure of manufacturing ever to come back. Housing construction did come back, but those manufacturers jobs didn't come back. So in a sense, we never recovered. Yeah, but I'm thinking time. about, I'm, you're, you're talking about kind of the consequences of what happened. I'm thinking about the cause and whether the cause was more people panicking. When you have all these recession called the panic of eight, 1909, the panic, yeah. Uh, you know, Black Friday, you know, Black Tuesday, or whatever it was when the market crashed in the Great Depression. When you have these statements that were made in the press about uh, uh, all the liar loans and ninja loans and ODOC loans, when there was such a small segment of the entire mortgage market and the mortgage market was a small segment of the entire financial market. Yeah, I wrote this book yeah, you know, this, this paper uh, uh, called The Big Con, which is on my website, kind of looking at each of the allegations, and, and then you look at the data 10 years later, and they don't support it. Anyway, that's my, we differ. We differ. You yeah. think it's more construction. You think it's more real. I think it's more psychological. And, but you think you think a recession is 50-50. I think it's uh, that the whole thing will hinge on banking. I think if we have... Uh, more banks fail. And recall that in the SNL crisis, something like 1,500 banks failed, but over nine years. Uh, so now we have banks that are keeping depositors from leaving by paying high interests, small and medium sized banks. And they're locked in. The money that they're keeping is paying out a low interest rate because they invested long term. And so that spells losses through time. And at some point that could translate into bank failure. Somebody Well, you think a bank failure means that the banking sector won't give loans, or what is a what in your mind is a my my concern is the psychology, is the fact that observing lots of banks, especially big banks, go under is enough to get me, who has nothing to do with banks, and you who has nothing to do with banks, firing my people who are your your customers and you firing your people who are my customers, that coordination failure, that's to me what is fundamental uh, with these recessions. Me meanwhile, we've had the unemployment rate at historically low level in the, in the midst of all yeah, these down, think, in, in the midst of all these bank failures that you're referring to, it doesn't show up whatsoever in the, in the labor market. Yeah, I, I think we don't, we don't have banking panic at the moment. We, but it couldn't, potentially happen. Um, be, be calm, everybody. It'll be okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not predicting, to be clear, I'm not predicting recession. I just uh, think if it's going to happen, it's going through that channel. We um, need more psychiatrists and fewer economists is what you're saying. 
Yeah, possibly. But let's talk about, I want to shift topics here and talk about your work um, in econometrics. You've been one of perhaps the most provocative economist or econometrician. Econometrics, again, is the use of statistics to analyze economic data. Ed has, uh, throughout his career, really um, tweaked a, economists and saying, you folks are analyzing data poorly and inappropriately, and you're misrepresenting what we can learn from it. You're, you're not using the right techniques. In particular, he's focused on Bayesian uh, econometrics. And Bayes, Thomas Bayes, right, was uh, a statistician or probabilist back around 17. He's a preacher, actually. Preacher, okay. <laughs> so he developed something that was, became called Bayes' Law. And I'm not sure. You were, we were talking today about whether or not he really appreciated the power of what he kind of wrote down back then uh, in terms of how it's being used today. But tell us about Bayesian econometrics. And, you know, for example, Ed wrote a paper called Taking the Con Out of Econometrics, as I recall, right? Yeah, that was the, the biggest mistake I made in my career. Because you pissed the, off all the econometricians. Yeah, I, they wanted to hear, let's put more tricks into econometrics. Yeah, I see. <laughs> so, so tell us about <clears throat> Bayesian, uh, Bayesian econometrics and, and the need to use it to make inferences because we don't have enough data uh, to pin things down. Okay, and, so... Um, yeah. My, my story begins when I was a graduate student at the University of Michigan, and they had uh, the economics of the building had three floors, a basement and, and two floors above ground, and the econometrics was taught at the top floor. That's where the priest told you never make a sin. You have one chance to estimate the model. You have to decide exactly what model you're going to use. Otherwise, you can't compute what they call sampling properties. You have to have pre-commitment. And then I go down into the basement. Because you can't use the same data twice. You can't use it, yeah. That's very important. Not, not everybody's an econometrician here, but if I take, and people make violate this uh, commandment all the time, if I use the data, one, if I have some data, I'm trying to relate Y to a bunch of Xs, about, you know, something maybe it's unemployment or GDP growth, to, to some explanatory variables, I have one data set. If I run a regression, I don't like the results, and I then I say I throw out these variables, these X's on the right hand side, put some other ones in, and keep fishing for a result that I like, because I'm trying to say that this particular X that I've left in has an impact on GDP. That's not kosher. That's called. That's called. Malfeasance. Malfeasance is a right. good name. Okay. And anyway, so and that was taught in the in the highest floor in the building. Right. right. But down in the basement, they were building the econometric model that was going to be used for forecasting. And they were analyzing, reanalyzing, reestimating the same model. And it was odd to have all that sinning going on when the preachers and the who the exactly the same people who were preaching on the top floor were down in the basement sinning. So while that was occurring, I was studying statistics. We're getting a master's degree in statistics in the mathematics department where I learned Bayesian inference. And I thought this Bayesian inference would allow us to bring the top floor and the basement into alignment rather than totally separate. And, and the fundamental idea of Bayesian inference is probabilities are descriptions of your uncertainty not natural occurrences. You don't know everything, so you summarize those probabilistically. For example, the flipping of a coin, if you could observe it perfectly, you could predict it perfectly. But without that perfect prediction, you your mind is going to summarize. You could predict whether or not it was a loaded coin or a fair coin. What you, yeah. fair, give, you give me whatever coin you want. Yeah. And if I had enough studies of how it was flipped, and I had the observing observing what exactly how it was flipped, then I could predict whether it was going to land heads or tails. Right. The physical world is like that. Right. And yet we as humans think of that as a random outcome. It's a 50-50 chance of being head or tail, even though nature makes it perfectly predictable one way or the other. 
So <clears throat> that's the first point of uh, Bayesian uh, science. But the, the way that, the, the simplest way of discussing it is <clears throat> in, um, you, you raised this point that if you had experimental data, which was subject to two uh, features, you had randomization of the treatment, that you're trying to estimate the impacts on some treatment, you randomize that and you control everything that's going on around you. Mm -hmm. Then you then you just look at the average of the treated right. uh, treated people and at average of the non-treated people and see if that's different. So it's a very simple thing. <clears throat> but to me, the the message of the science is don't try to estimate the law of gravity in a hurricane. Because that 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 uh, feather that you drop is going to be influenced by gravity, but it's going to be flown here and there constantly, and that's the problem with economists. We have we're studying a completely uncontrolled environment, so we don't have control the ability to do control experiments like the the physicists. Right? We don't have randomization, and we don't have controls. Okay. So the absence of controls means that you have to add additional variables into your model. Yeah. that we're not controlled. You have to explain why the wind blowing this way or that way, you know, all those additional variables. And the problem is nobody knows what those variables are. And we can have a discussion and we can uh, talk about it. And in order to have a complete list of variables, it's going to overload the data set. So you, you walk in and talk to the data and say, this is my model. I have this variables treatment. I have these hundred different variables that controls. So can you tell me what the treatment effect is? The data say, no, I can't. That's too big a model. I can't take this small amount of evidence and spread it over a hundred different parameters and, and use it to give so you a sense yeah. of what the treatment is. It's like running a regression with, let's say, a thousand observations, but you have a million right hand, right? A thousand observations of 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 Y, but you have a million possible X's on the right hand side yeah uh, you just don't have enough data to pin down the impact of those x's on the y's so the solution the Bayesian Bayesians would say is I'm going to uh, create a fictitious data set that I'm going to combine with the data set we have in front of us and I'm not doing it secretly I'm telling you that I'm adding it to the analysis and that fictitious data set is a representation of my state of mind before I see the experimental results. So I ask the data, don't tell me the true treatment effect. Tell me whether I need to change my mind. If you have a state of mind characterized by probabilistic uncertainty, and you ask the data whether I need to change my mind. So or it's not. like you, you have in your mind that you've run regressions with the with all the data, with, with a ton of data, and then you've been able to pin down some information about these 100 Xs or whatever. Well, I would say you X's, have, yeah. what you have in mind is there's 10 Xs yeah. that are probably important. Yeah. So you leave, you, you put those to an elevated position You use more of the data evidence to work on those. But there's these other 50, I just don't really think they're going to matter. So in order for them to matter, they're going to have to overcome my sense that they don't matter. So that fictitious data set that I described has, <clears throat> ha it says that this set of variables are very important and this set of possibly important. And then <clears throat> you ask the data what it thinks. Now, um, so, so another way to think about this, I guess, would be to say, you're coming at the data for this study that you're using kind of uh, implicitly as if you've run other studies and you're summarizing those other studies in your head in terms of the probability of this X having an impact of this size on that yeah. Y, right? And that, and that that's Bayesian inference. You're bringing your beliefs to the, to the data. And so the, and then you're using uh, the, the two things together, the, the new debt, the new evidence and the old evidence, which you've, uh, compactly, uh, you know, uh, accum you know you, you've uh, made very succinct in, in terms of probabilities, and then you end up with an inference, which is an opinion about 
what is impacting what, and, and that's the changing of the mind. Because, yeah. Because when you come in with, and you go out with, they're two different things. Okay, so then I want to that's introduce this conversation two words. One is sturdy, and the other is fragile. And if you have scientifically generated data with, with proper controls and with proper randomization of treatment, that's a setting in which you can make sturdy conclusions. But in the setting that we just described, unless you have a, extreme commitment to that fictitious data set, it's possibly fragile because tomorrow morning you might wake up and say, you know, that, that fictitious data set really wasn't a characterization of my state of mind. And the result is you get a, a, a fragile outcome. And that's really what I try to do is produce methods that would uh, summarize your state of mind where you think this variable is more important than other, other variables and indicate how, uh, if that state of mind isn't as perfect as you described, like if you change it a certain amount, does that little bit of change alter the conclusions from the data set? In which case it's fragile, but a little bit of change uh, doesn't matter, then you got a sturdy result. So I try to introduce into the conversation among economists a sense of humility, which is the vast majority of the conclusions that they draw from real non-experimental data are fragile, and we need to admit it. And we need to have methods by which we separate the sturdy from the fragile conclusion. So part of what you're saying is that, you know, you brought prior beliefs uh, leading to a posterior beliefs the combination of prior beliefs and new data, new evidence leading to posterior, but you also looked at how strong your prior beliefs had to be to not change your, for your priors not to be, for your posterior not to be a whole lot different from your prior. Well, is no, that, no, that's not, that's not, not another way to say it. No, it's a, it's a question of whether you describe the prior accurately or not. I had, I'm, gave you a task that you, it's impossible for you to do, which is create a fictitious data set that you can pool with the data set in front of you. And, mm -hmm. and you can try, you can say this, well, this estimate would be probably positive and a point two, and it would have a standard error of some kind, and you could do it. But again, you wouldn't really know how to do it. So you have to carry out a sensitivity analysis. Another way of saying it is that the, the traditional approach um, of estimating a model with lots of variables, you need to know if you eliminated one or two of those variables, would the conclusions change dramatically? That's another kind so of- So you came up with techniques for how to basically uh, make, you know, figure this out uh, so that, you know, methodology for figuring out the sensitivity of the results to your priors. Is that a fair- Yeah, and I try to do- I tried to produce conventional measures. So there's a conventional measure of statistical certainty called a T-statistic. I've suggested a conventional measure of sturdiness, which I called an S-statistic. So I would like to have associated with each of your inferences, okay. Okay. both the T-statistic and S, S. T means it's statistically reliable, and S means it doesn't depend on small changes in the model. Small changes in the prior, small changes, when you say cha small changes in the model. Yeah. Do you, do you mean the prior belief? I, I, do, I would say it in terms of the prior belief, but, but a small change means the, 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 the coefficient in the model comes from a different distribution. It's a small change. I, I still say a, a model is, uh, has these statistical parameters in it, and it combines with that a description of the prior with regard to those parameters. So, so let me let me try and kind of raise this question that kind of uh, arises from what you're saying, which is I have a whole bunch of econometricians uh, or economists or other people, or just social scientists or just general public. They're looking at some data that uh, everybody's looking at the same data. Uh, but they're all coming at it with different prior beliefs. So they for, all form different posterior beliefs. They all end up with different, everybody might be influenced to, to move. Some people might change their mind a, little, a lot and some people might change it a little bit. Some might, people might hardly change it at all, but you're saying that there's no 
answer answering specific questions in in econometrics that we can't definitively answer uh, anything because we all have our own kind of opinion at the end. We're all going to be influenced in the same direction, more or less. But well, well, we yeah. actually can't say for sure this thing is true. That this is a that we're always going to end up with a distribution of beliefs out there about uh, any kind of economic relationship. Well, let's take a, a possibility whether higher interest rates come with higher growth or lower growth. There should, could be some economists who thought that would be lower and some would be higher. So you could characterize those two opinions and ask if you have that opinion, what happens if you actually see the data? And sometimes it's going to bring those two groups together and sometimes it's going to cast them apart. Seeing the same data can go either way. But ideally, if the data sets large enough and, and, uh, and statistically accurate enough, then it'll bring about a, a, a coincidence of the posterior. People will agree on what the conclusions are once they see the data. Okay, so there's some, uh, yeah, yeah uh, some cohesion of minds here that comes, people, people uh, uh, reaching uh, more uniform views, but uh, there's no guarantee that we have enough data that people will ever agree, right? We have, well, I, I would add, maybe you agree or disagree on this point, but, but 99% of what economists believe is theoretical and it isn't empirical. And one reason we don't are much in, not influenced by data is people understand the fragile nature of the econometric approaches. Because we don't have enough data and because people are misusing the data we do have. Yeah. Because was the con in econometrics taking the con out of econometrics? Was that mostly about people mis reusing the same data? Was that the biggest? Well, you uh, say reusing it mean, means that you have the dependent variable stays the same, but you use a different list of explanatory variables. So you, you think that GDP is going to... Um, be, the growth will be lower if the interest rate is higher. So you run the uh, regression and the coefficient turns out to be the wrong sign. So you say, I've got to add another variable into my equation. i got to keep fishing for variables to make, yeah, to, get, to get the coefficient that I need to get this article published and get tenure. Yeah. Yeah. I saw that firsthand as a research assistant for certain professors that you, that you know uh, from Harvard when I was a grad student. The, um, By the way, psychologists have gotten themselves deeply in trouble through this fishing exercise, and they produce what seem like statistically reliable estimates, but they're all based on fishing, and people discover that after the fact. And what about, you know, pe people in the area of finance will say that there's been no 30-year period in the U.S. history of the stock market where if you put down a thousand bucks, you wouldn't end up with more, more, a lot more than a thousand bucks 30 years later. But they're using, you know, there's no, we only have probably three independent 30 years of data. Uh, what's your reaction to that, you know, reuse of the same observa annual observations in making that kind of inference? Well, that's, that's a, a statistical error. That you have to, you said there's only one, one or two experiments. I, by the way, I thought that the real value of the stock market in, uh, after it collapsed, or before the collapse in 1929, it didn't get back to where it was before until 1955, I thought. Yeah, so but that's not 30, 30 years. Yeah, but it wasn't, 30, but 30 years, yes. <laughs> okay. I know, shorter period of time, it was definitely, uh, it took a long time to come back for sure. Uh, and the Japanese market is going down, but I'm just wondering about the, the use of overlapping data, basically. If you, uh, is that kosher or is not? Well, you were asking whether the, the process is permanent process or does it vary over time? It definitely varies over time. So you have to deal with that with a statistical model that allows for 
drift in all the parameters. But I mean, if I'm if I'm using, uh, I say from 19, let's say 30 to 1960, positive gain. From 1931 to 1961, positive gain. I'm using this most of the data are overlapping and saying, yeah. is that a problem? Yeah, absolutely. That's a problem. Okay, so we actually can't really make that. People in finance are all the time in personal finance. Advisors are all the time saying there's no 30 year period during which uh, you would have lost money. And they're basing that on this kind of reuse of the same data as opposed to saying, okay, here's three. They're not saying we just have three data points to make the statement. And by the way, the Japanese market, here's an a 30 year period where the market was lower than it was when it began. There's, they're not saying that, they're claiming that this is a sure thing. You invest in the market 30 years later, you can know for sure that because we have all these observations of 30 year periods. Uh, so you agree with me that this is a problem. It definitely is a problem. Okay. So let's turn to your work in, in international economics. I forgot that now. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot that. No, no, no. Uh, so you've worked in kind of the microeconomics of, of international economics. You've worked on uh, uh, on issues, for example, on NAPFA, right? Yes. Uh, tell me, t- tell us about your work on NAPFA, the North Atlantic uh, Free Trade. Yeah, uh, so just so you know, the subject of international economics is divided between microeconomics and macroeconomics. By macroeconomics, that means exchange rates and external imbalances. And the micro is about who produces what and what the gains are to the economy. So I was a microeconomist, not macro. A lot of international economists do both, and some are specialized in one area or the other, but I was strictly micro. And, and uh, so I studied what's called comparative advantage, the extent to which countries emphasize in their exports their, their comparative advantage. That's a, what's known as the extra lean model. And uh, you asked me NAFTA. I was studying NAFTA uh, and made the point that if we had an open door, if, if, if products come into the United States from Mexico without any tariffs, then we might as well have the same rules with regard to products from Asia, because those Asian products could always go through the Mexican door. So don't think of NAFTA as a negotiation just with Mexico, it's a much larger, more important point. You're saying it was like a, a free trade agreement with the entire world. Yeah. And uh, implicitly. And is that kind of borne out by the data? We started seeing Chinese products coming right through Mexico. Well, some of it does, but I think it's we didn't build big tariffs on China until the Trump era. I don't know what happened to Mexican Trey, maybe that that bumped up when Trump did that. But. I think I think it did. Yeah. Um, the uh, and so, do you think on balance this was a good thing for the U.S.? A lot of people on both in both parties think that NAFTA was a mistake. That we should that we lost our manufacturing sector. Thirty five percent of workers in manufacturing in nineteen sixty down to you said eight percent today. Uh, would we have been done better as a country? Would we have less inequality? Would we have more uh, more cohesion as a country had we basically not traded? Uh, well, the, the, the economists had traditionally been totally in favor of free trade, but looking back, it seems like a really bad idea. My, my view is we built them democracy in America in our factories because that's where we created the middle class Americans and when the factories disappeared and there weren't those jobs anymore the the people who lived in those communities that lost all those jobs they're just angry and they have nothing else to do really in the economy so we went quickly from an industrial age to a post-industrial age and it just destroyed the political system I really do think all the all the um fighting between the right wing and the left wing is fundamentally driven by our lack of manufacturing jobs. I ask the question, can you name a democracy that doesn't have any manufacturing jobs? 
Uh, well, it depends on what you define as a democracy. That's true. Um, but the problem with without manufacturing. Well, I mean, think about Sweden or Denmark. Or, those are democracies. Or, so do they have a much higher share in manufacturing? Yeah, they do. They maintain that. Switzerland too, I guess, right? But they they concentrate at the higher, strictly on the higher end of manufacturing. And they also export um, lumber, I think. They've been doing that for a long time. But the right. thing is that the, the and the, I think the words that we don't use enough in economics are creative destruction. They came from Marx and that Harvard professor, I forget who. Um, oh, uh, this is, um, <laughs> I'm blanking too. It'll come to me in a second. Uh, yeah, at, uh, go ahead. At any rate, an in, in innovation that yeah. you may have that you contributes to the welfare and economy also destroys the value of other innovations that occurred before. And that the, the failure of the capitalist system is it doesn't compensate the losers from that game. You get, yeah. your innovation is gonna get paid both for the creative aspect to it and also for the disruption that occur. An example would be Amazon, which um, gets paid for its creativity because we can shop highly effectively on the internet, we all benefit from that. Right. But Amazon also gets paid for the destruction of, of the retail that occurred. And this example of moving jobs overseas, that helps the business, uh, the highest people in the business, they make money off of that because they get workers at a lower price, but it's har extremely harmful for the well, jobs. So okay, but when you think about, I mean, you know, think about the this chair that we're sitting in. It could well be that it's uh, it was half as expensive because it was made in China, yeah, or Malaysia, or Vietnam, or the Philippines, right? Uh, so, uh, you know, that would also this is also helping middle class job, middle class. You're talking so about the benefits from from creative, yeah, from creative disruption. I mean, That's a creative aspect, be, yeah. But 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 the destruction is we destroyed our democracy. I don't think the fact that you've got a cheap chair <laughs> offsets the fact that we destroyed our democracy. Uh, so would you, if you're president, if you're my vice president, yeah, you're going to push for uh, higher tariffs on China. I mean, well, you know, I think that one of the biggest is that what problems, you're advocating? one of the biggest problems, is the external deficit that we've had, six hundred, seven hundred billion dollars, and that is driven. To, to a large extent to from the federal deficit. We, we need to borrow money from external sources and Chinese and other external sources are throwing money at us in order to um, fund our deficits. And uh, that's created an elevated real exchange rate and lower exports and more imports. So I would think one of the first things you ought to do, you, you, you should do as president, I'm sure you would, is to deal with the federal deficit. Well, the yeah, I mean, there's been not just the deficit, but there's a whole whole policy of taking from young people, giving old people through different means, uh, you know, cutting people's taxes, running deficits, but also shifting the structure of taxation from uh, taxing capital gains and dividends to taxing uh, wages uh, relatively more than those things. Uh, there's also pay-as-you-go Social Security, which we, uh, Medicare, the expansion of Medicare. And through time, the age consumption profile shifted from uh, the elderly consuming relatively less than middle-aged workers uh, to the elderly consuming about 40% more. So, and the elderly are closer to the end of their days, so they have a higher propensity to consume. So, uh, you really can see what's happened in the data. The, the saving rate of the country's gone from about 13% in the 50s down to about 3% today yeah. over time. Not 3% now, though. It's a little higher. Mm. This personal savings? No, no. This Overall? is nas oh. net national saving. Oh, no, okay. So comprehensive <clears throat> net national saving rate, 3%. And a country that has a lot of investment opportunities and only is only saving... 3% of its national income, of course, foreigners are going to invest here. Yeah, totally. So, 
By, by the way, my, my simple explanation of what you said is that back in the Reagan era, the Republicans and Democrats got together and um, passed a law, a remarkable law that requires every young person in America, every child in America has to give a credit card to their grandparents and their grandparents could use that credit card to, uh, to improve their lives the way you were describing and to pay for the medical bills, but putting a huge uh, burden on those young kids when they get older and they have to do the debt service. So you're saying that the policy is equivalent to just uh, giving money, giving the elderly uh, credit card bills, but, but you know, that foreign investment has helped middle, you know, workers in the US, uh, you really would not, if you're, if you're in charge, you're really gonna put up massive tariffs against uh, imports? I would have make, made the loss of manufacturing jobs slower and try to create- uh, By uh, subsidizing manufacturing? Wouldn't that be violating like World Trade Organization uh, rules? Well, the, the, to have an external uh, deficit, is a problem and eliminate that is, isn't a violation of those rules. As far as tariffs are concerned, I'm, I'm not sure I'd have to rethink this whole thing, but I'm, I feel very uncomfortable looking backward to see how many jobs were lost in manufacturing and they never came back. Millions and millions of jobs and these so many communities in the Midwest especially have been decimated. But the horse and buggy went away too, right? Yeah, that's true. I mean, <clears throat> we used to have high, home farms. I mean, isn't this just progress? Why can't we be shifting into, is it really the manufacturing that we're missing or is it the education, uh, quality of the education that we're missing here? Well, I, I think education is a critical point, which is that um, when, we, when we went from a pre-industrial to an industrial society, there was a lot of equipment that Schumpeter. was- Schumpeter. Yeah, Schumpeter. <laughs> I wonder if your audience knows who you're talking about now. <laughs> he was the he was an economist in like 1920s at Harvard. Harvard 1930s at Harvard, very famous Austrian economist came over and um, had this view of capitalism. At that point, it wasn't a mathematical science that really happened with Samuelson's thesis. He really mathematized mm -hmm. economics and immediately was fired for having done so and went over to MIT and made that the best department in the world for arguably even today. I don't know, there's, you can argue this, Chicago, whatever, Stanford. The, um, so which, I want to finish my thought, which is yeah. in the Victorian age, the, the parents would pass on, on uh, economic power to their children by a, the transfer of land. And <clears throat> In the, in, in when we went from a pre-industrial to industrial power, we yeah. pulled a lot of people off the farms and put them in work in manufacturing that paid about two or three times as much as they were working, were, as much as they were earning on the farms. And um, that allowed people who were not very, those, that equipment allowed people who were not very strong to drive a forklift. And no matter how strong you are, Larry, compared to me, if we were both driving a forklift, we would be equally productive. So it eliminated uh, uh, natural talent as a source of economic uh, value because you were right. It was this is all embodied in the equipment, and so that produces equality. Um, so, we're we're moving into a post-industrial world in which it's the talent is natural talent becomes the most important thing because all the mundane intellectual tasks are going to be carried off by the computer more and more over time. The forklift will be self-driving. Yes, sir. The, yeah. I went to a, um, uh, a couple of years ago, we went, uh, my wife Bridget and I went to, on sabbatical, we were in Scotland. We went to visit a um, Scotch uh, distillery and the young lady was, giving the tour and she's taking us through this super modern plant. And she said, big smile on her face uh, when we're in the middle of this, all the, these mechanized uh, uh, facilities, and she points to the control, control room, a glass room where there are three people. She said, 
uh, in a matter of a few years, we went from 500 people to three running the factory. <laughs> and she was, and I was thinking to myself, <clears throat> when I come back, it's going to be a robot taking us on the tour and she won't have her job. And so let's finish by talking about uh, AI and the potential mass destruction of jobs and where this country is going to fare. You'd like to, you're, you're kind of yearning for yesteryear where we could have Pittsburgh and all these cities and Cleveland being the center of production. We may, you know, be able to get them to produce more missiles or whatever chips if we put enough money into it, but we can't do this throughout the country. We just can't, I don't think, go back to 35% no, I, I totally agree with that. I'm, I'm Especially just saying, when we're competing with, with, you know, the manufacturing might be just computers doing all the, in effect, smart machines doing all the manufacturing. So how are we going to survive well, as a country? Well, let me say that yeah. what you're talking about in productivity improvement, yeah. that was operating throughout the first half of the 20th century, as well as the second half. But we were growing manufacturing. The reason was there were new products that were being introduced. If you look at it- New products uh, that needed people, but no, no we products. Had... 19, you go to a house in 1900 and yeah. look around and then look, go to at the same or a similar house in 1950. Right. And the house in 1950 has a flush toilet and has a, 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 a stereo. Okay. So it, that produced plumbers and re repair people. But also clubs. people who built the stuff in manufacturing. So it, it expanded. The need for new. No, I agree with you over the, about the history, but the, but if you look at the horse, let me go ahead. Okay, look at the horse. Yeah, the horse and buggy. I mean, yeah. we had 50 million horses in like 1910. We now have three million in the country. Yeah. So the horses just were put completely out of work, and they were basically, you know, left to die. Well, whatever. I agree that humans could have died earlier, but <laughs> I'm telling you that that was offset by. The, the manufacturing maintained its employment in the face of improvement so these are productivity the, yeah. because there were all these new products. But the second half of the 20th century had hardly any new products. You had, you know, a cell phone, and then you have a new cell phone, a new cell phone. That doesn't create new jobs. So, so it's the product innovation that saved the American democracy in the second half. And in the first half of the century. And now do you see gone. this happening to save us again? No, I don't. I don't. I, and so, so I think, I do not think that we'll ever get back to where we were. I just said, if we could turn the clock backward, we should have uh, allowed the disappearance of manufacturing jobs to be more slow, slower and try to think about how we're going to take care of these communities that are losing all these jobs. Now, you you say AI. The problem with with the computer now is it does a mundane intellectual task. So all that's left is the creative task. And if you think about uh, computing software, designing software system, what fraction of natural human beings are able to do that task? It's like being able to sing and 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 uh, being able to compete in the singing market. It's a very special skill. Right, that that you're going to pass on to your children if you have it. That's like the Victorian land, but the vast majority of Americans or people around the globe will not be in that special uh, community. But we do know that countries like Switzerland and Scandinavia, they are Germany, they have uh, been able to maintain a high middle class living standard, uh, and it's not by putting everybody through college. Switzerland has maybe 20% of people going to college. It's vocational schools are a big deal, but they also are paying their teachers as much as a full professor of physics or economics at the university. They have a very different, uh, so if you're a kindergarten teacher, you're being extremely well remunerated. And so you're having highly educated people coming out of that system and they're not all going to you know, now they can become precision workers. They have the some basic skills they've learned or learning skills. What I'm more, thinking that that's the answer, not that it's not product innovation, that it really goes back to education. And I'm thinking that the way to, to equalize education uh, so that we have 
I mean, we have in all the big, all the inner city schools, we have third, fourth, fifth graders not reading to grade level, not doing math to grade level. No, that's and true. they're being passed into the next, promoted to the next grade. We need to have an equalization of education. The easy way to do that is to have the Department of Education put courses up, online courses that people can just sit there, kids can just sit there with a headset and watch for half the day, the best teachers in the country teaching uh, eighth grade algebra. That to me is the solution. Well, I have a different opinion about this. Go ahead. To me, I just have to wrap up, but go ahead. Education is conversation. It can't be watching somebody give a talk. It has to be an ability to speak back and forth in order to become really educated, be a creative person. Otherwise, just memorizing stuff that uh, is on the lecture. And then when you when you talk about job dis displacements, I worry that a robot's going to take your job soon. <laughs> <laughs> well, it could happen. The uh, <laughs> uh, well, I'm thinking about you know people taking online courses, but also having quizzes having the teacher walk around, interact. What I sense is that the classroom situation in the inner cities and, and many other public schools, uh, there's so many kids per teacher, there's so many disruptive kids per class that no real education is taking place. Better they should memorize something than learn nothing. I agree with to that. Memorize I agree with that. Is my, my sense of what we need to do. And, uh, Maybe uh, President Biden will be watching this and appoint the uh, Secretary of Education tomorrow. But the Department of Education and the Secretary of Education can put up these courses instantly. Why do we not have every kid in the country being able to log into the Department of Education and take a course at his grade level on the weekend at night with his parents or in school in Chemistry, eighth grade, whatever, tenth grade chemistry, whatever it is. So um, this is to me to be this is reminding me of one day I had given the students the yeah. task of uh, doing an empirical study of the impact of interest rates on the U.S. economy. Yep. And the kind of vague task that they had to make more precise in order to carry it out. And then I walked in and I said, today I am Alexa. And I know a lot about econometrics. I know a lot about the economy and interest rates, but I can only answer your questions. Are there any questions? <laughs> so I was a robot at that point. But my point would be <clears throat> the conversation. This is a conversation between the students and the robot, which is an, edu an educational experience. Yeah. And maybe we'll get to the point where <laughs> we can have uh, uh, software on the Department of Education's website where people can interact with. That's what I have in mind. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Anyway. Ed, thank you so much. Okay, great, Larry. Uh, thanks, everybody, for uh, listening in. And we'll be back with another cool uh, podcast from Economics Matters, the podcast uh, sooner than you think. <laughs>